Hello, I'm Hagyang Heidi Kong from Seattle University, and today I'll be presenting Addressing Cognitive and Emotional Barriers in Parent-Clinician Communication Through Behavioral Visualization Web Tools. Being a new parent comes with lots of exciting firsts, such as seeing your child take the first step or celebrating their first birthday, but it also comes with lots of less exciting routines, such as going in to see the doctor. Pediatric visits become an essential and regular part of life where parents desire to accurately convey their concerns and questions and seek reassurance that their child is doing okay. However, challenges are introduced when the conversation goes beyond a regular well-being checkup to a discussion about the child's developmental delays or disabilities. First, there are cognitive barriers introduced by medical terms or statistics and data presented in a format that is hard to understand. And second, there are emotional barriers, especially at the time of diagnosis when parents are often in denial. In a study on pediatric consultations, parents emphasized the importance of how things were said rather than what was said and could be satisfied or dissatisfied with the same diagnosis and treatment recommendation depending on the communication delivery. And through our work, we present behavioral visualization as a means of improving the communication delivery. Prior research on visualization in healthcare has mainly focused on its exploratory role, where clinicians use visualization for analysis. But visualization also provides a great way to explain and communicate data. While some research had been done on the role of visualization in parent-clinician communication, they have focused on the clinician's perspective and not on the parental perspective. To address this gap, we interviewed both parents and clinicians on the use of two visualization web tools in hypothetical parent-clinician communication. For the parent interviews, we recruited 10 families through our local school, and the inclusion criteria were parents with children who were 0 to 5 years old who showed signs of developmental delays but were not officially diagnosed. The school made the judgment on who met the criteria and recruitment flyers were sent to selected families. The parents attended two sessions. The first session was conducted at the school where the parent and child participated in a rapid ABC session, which stands for the Rapid Attention Back and Forth Communication Test. This five-minute pre-screening test was developed to identify infants and toddlers at risk for autism. A rapid ABC session consists of five stages of play, greeting, rolling a ball, reading a book, wearing the book as a hat, and tickling. Each stage contains one or more examiner bits that are used to prompt for certain behaviors such as eye contact and other simple communication skills. Here is a short clip of the ball stage. Are you ready to play with some new toys? Yeah. Look at my ball! So here he reaches out to indicate that he wants the ball, which is an example of communicative behaviors that we're checking for. Each stage was highly structured for easy comparison across different sessions. And these videos were then hand-coded in speech, gaze, and gesture to show the number and duration of communicative behaviors. Then the parents came back for the second session in two or three weeks where they saw their child's rapid ABC session using two visualization web tools, PlexLines and Engaze. Each tool consisted of a video player, an authoring tool where you could toggle certain behaviors or settings, and behavioral visualizations. Half of the parents started with PlexLines and half started with Engaze and they watched a five-minute introductory video for each web tool before the exploration. Both tools covered annotated behaviors in all three modalities, but used different visual encodings to emphasize different types of behaviors, and we'll focus on plex lines for illustration. Here is an example of the hat face in plex lines. Their circle size is proportional to the duration of the behavior, which made plex lines useful for showing behaviors with longer durations, shown with larger circles. In the example here, the examiner first prompts, where's the book? The child then gazes at the examiner's face, points at the book, and says, there, there. 
Here is Plex lines in action with a rapid ABC session matched with the corresponding visualization. So you see the yellow bar that moves along the visualization, which is acting as a visual seek bar. And when the child taps on the desk or holds onto the ball, the green circles show up representing the gesture. So the parents could click on the visualization to go back and watch specific section of the session, as well as learn what is going on through the visualization itself. For clinician interviews, we interviewed 13 participants at a children's hospital. They had an average of 17 years of experience working with children with developmental disorders and their occupations range from board certified behavioral analyst or BCBA, speech language pathologist, autism family navigator, etc. And the procedure was similar to the second session for parents where they explored both visualization web tools and discussed them afterwards. We asked both parents and clinicians to rate how useful these visualization web tools would be in their communication about the child from one not useful to five very useful. The average rating was 4.25 for parents and 3.42 for clinicians. And I'll explain the lower rating by clinicians later on in the challenges section. As for the participants who rated the web tools as useful or very useful, they named several benefits of the visualization that address current challenges in clinical communication. As for addressing cognitive needs, both parents and clinicians appreciated how one could highlight moments of interest through the visualization web tools. Parents often felt lost for words during their short sessions with clinicians, but visualizations could act as a conversational bridge since they could simply point to the section they wanted to talk about. Similarly, clinicians said this would be nice for highlighting moments that they want parents to focus on. Another anticipated benefit of visualizing behaviors for parents was being able to see a different view of the child. When we asked whether the parents had noticed anything new about their child's behaviors, they mentioned the presence of eye gaze. Here is an example of engaged visualization where this section represents the child's gaze during the book phase. The light blue strips represent when the child was looking at the book and the dark blue sections represent when the child was looking at the examiner. So this section shows how the child's gaze rapidly switched back and forth between the book and the examiner. And this demonstrated an important communicative behavior called joint attention which often goes by unnoticed by an untrained observer. The visualization also showed the level of engagement, and some parents were surprised by their child's level of engagement where the child was more engaged than they had supposed or less engaged, as the case shown here. While you could watch a video of the session in the web tool, subtle behaviors such as quick gestures are easy to miss in the videos, and they were much more salient through the visualizations. So many parents use visualizations to confirm their child's level of engagement, although they had the general idea through the videos. And when parents noticed a lack of engagement through the visualizations, they did a lot of sense making, such as pointing out that the child was shy because they were unfamiliar with the examiner, or pointing out other modalities where the child did better. Next, visualization could provide a point for comparison. When we showed a visualization of their child's session, a lot of the parents wanted to see what the norm looked like. While clinicians weren't against comparing one child against another because everyone had their own pace of development, they were more optimistic about providing a normalized or aggregated form to show what a session for a typically developing child might look like. Clinicians also reported that it could be useful for addressing emotional needs by showing the strength of a child which could be often overlooked in conversations. For example, they could start out by explaining parts of the session where the child was more engaged to establish a positive tone. Another role of visualization that was brought up was acting as a longitudinal record of a child. While parents and children participated in a single session for our study, web tools could be used to display progress over time by stacking sessions of the same child vertically as shown here. Most parents indicated that this could serve as an accurate longitudinal record of their child's development. And clinicians envisioned using this longitudinal record to display pre 
and post-intervention assessments to demonstrate the effectiveness of a treatment. One participant said, most standardized tests are normed towards children with typically developing social skills. They are not normed for children with autism, so standardized tests often don't show as much progress. I can see this visualization web tool being a really useful tool to document progress. Like, this is where we were before, and this is where we are now, this many more times they pointed and vocalized. Many clinicians also noted that visualizations would provide objective evidence, especially when the parent is in denial. A participant stated, if I say they don't have eye contact, they don't look at me. That's something subjective, but this visualization is not. See how many times it didn't happen? I think parents would be more open to this most of the time. If you take the person out of it, it's harder to argue against data than another person. And lastly, visualizations could be used as a privacy-preserving mechanism since parents were generally very comfortable with sharing visualizations in situations where they would not share videos. And this is important since clinicians face many situations where sharing information would be useful, but they can't because of HIPAA, which sets rules about sharing medical information. There are definitely remaining challenges and limitations such as the lower rating by clinicians that were mainly due to their concerns on some parents' ability to understand the graphs. While parents in our study reported the tools as both easy to use and interpret, their education level was higher than that of the average population. So this is an area to be further explored. Next, we studied the anticipated benefits through individual interviews, and future studies are needed to confirm these benefits through actual parent-clinician conversations. And lastly, visualization may not be as objective as people assume. We have a discussion on the subjectivity of visualization and ways to overcome this problem in the paper if you're interested. To conclude, in this talk, we presented data visualization web tools as a method of facilitating parent-clinician communication through addressing cognitive barriers by highlighting important moments, displaying a different view of the child, and providing a point of comparison, as well as providing a longitudinal record of the child's development. It could also address emotional barriers by showing the strength of the child acting as an objective evidence, and preserving privacy while sharing behavioral data with others. Thanks for listening, and I'd like to thank my collaborator, Carrie Karahelius, as well as Easter Seals Children Development Laboratory, and all the participants, including the parents and their children. If you have any questions, please email me at the address shown here.